we will be creating that Zoom session uh, for each week. And then lastly, you'll see here there's a question. And I will post that question on the Monday of that week. And that will be due by the lecture. Uh, the answer should just be a very short one paragraph answer. Nothing, uh, not a long paper. Uh, it's just important to be very brief. And the question will just uh, stimulate thought. And uh, depending on how things go, if we need a, uh, need to change the final exam or the midterm or something, we will also be using these short answers for grading. Uh, so it's very important that you do these uh, questions. They're very simple, uh, just a short answer. So for example, the question for this week, which I posted this evening and is due on Monday, so you don't have to do it by the lecture, is give an example of innovation in biology. So some example from biology, animals, plants, uh, cells, molecules, whatever it is, uh, think of some example of uh, innovation, uh, a new, new type of approach that has allowed this biological system to exist and propagate. And I'll give you a very uh, <clears throat> important example. So all of us are dealing with COVID-19, the virus. The virus is now going around all over the world. It is becoming reality, as we talked about. And the virus, through evolution, uh, has found some innovative way to infect and cause damage to human beings. Now, innovation is uh, sometimes a good thing, right? But uh, it found a new way to infect and damage humans, and that new way was established. So what do we have to do as a society? We have to innovate with a vaccine. We have to innovate with uh, social distancing measures and testing. We're doing innovation to counter that innovation. So biological innovation is very important example. Uh, you may want to go into business. You say, why do we learn about biology? But uh, many people know that the best examples of innovation are from biology. So that's why we start this lecture uh, talking about biology and evolution. And I will actually give a presentation also on COVID-19. So we can understand that innovation as well. Uh, so that was the reason for this question. Give an example of innovation in biology. So I still want you to answer that. Obviously, it's too late for this lecture. But uh, for the next lectures, every Monday, I will post a question. And before the lecture, you should send a one paragraph answer. You can also have a picture. You can attach a file. You can type it in. Uh, that's fine. Uh, this is not a long paper. And uh, I have to warn you, though, as you know, they say sometimes writing something shorter is more difficult than a long paper. So I don't want to make it difficult, but uh, I don't want you to think, oh, I got to do five pages, 10 pages every week. That's not the point. Be a, do, do one paragraph, very thoughtful. Uh, every, everything makes sense? Yep. Okay, good. So now, let's go to the lecture. Uh, before we start, uh, any questions from last time? I will actually review the lecture every week. So I will spend a short time reviewing last week, so don't worry. I think we have one new student here. Uh, but if you have any pressing questions uh, or any questions, let me know now. Uh, I may say, oh, I'll answer it during the lecture. Uh, so type in your questions now from last week.
if you have any. Okay, so let's start. The title for today is Adaptation and Evolution, Innovation and Biology. So last week we did uh, an overview of creativity and innovation. We did the many different kinds of innovation and we learned that innovation is essentially bringing new ideas and into some sustainable reality or uh, combining old ideas in a new way again to become reality. And this week we're going to talk about biology examples from biology. Uh, I wanted to emphasize again the structure of the course. This first half, we are going to be talking about some fundamentals and history. And the second half, we'll talk about actual methods and applications of innovation. So the question for uh, today was give an example of innovation in biology. And uh, even if we don't answer the question in writing until Monday, uh, does anyone want to uh, give a try at this, give an example uh, of innovation in biology? You want to type in an example, or you can turn on, we have, only have 11 people here, so you can also turn on your microphone if you want. Anybody have an idea? Uh, as I heard um, that, how it called, planes uh, was, uh, like, idea came from birds. Oh, the planes came yes. from birds, okay. So that's a very good point. Uh, of course, Leonardo da Vinci was thinking of flight and he uh, was studying birds and anatomy. And he also did a lot of engineering. You raise a very good point that we are going to talk about later. Uh, my question was actually an example of innovation in biology. What you mentioned is more an example of what we call bio-inspired innovation. In other words, something from in engineering that biology inspired. That's actually very important. You can also imagine businesses. This is the Soulbridge International School of Business. What does biology have to do with it? But if you think of a business organization, like an ecosystem or like an organism, and they have different uh, cells and different organs, and how do they function? How do they communicate? We can learn from biology. We call that bio-inspired innovation. So actually, I like your answer because it was not entirely correct. It wasn't innovation in biology. It was application of biology. At the end of this lecture, I will be talking about bio-inspired innovation uh, and give some examples. And that is important. So I want you to know that there is a direct application of some of these ideas uh, and not just a theoretical framework. That's a good answer. Any, any other thoughts? Give an example of innovation in biology. Marius Eckert, you're thinking. Yes. Um, I was thinking about the, uh, that over time, I heard that uh, Keep, uh, that men are um, lesser and lesser getting wisdom teeth and that's uh -huh. a, a product of ev evolution. That's a very interesting point. So actually we're going to talk about teeth and innovation. Uh, the wisdom tooth issue is, uh, is, is complicated but uh, uh, the teeth developed uh, as an innovation for a different diet and the whole uh, changes with respect to uh, w wisdom teeth may be related to that. So we'll actually give that as an example. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Rita, what do you think? Any examples of innovation in biology that come mm -hmm. to mind? I've ever heard about the remote operation. So um, Where do you we have a they remote operation. Remote? operation so it's like the in this 
hospital in America can do a uh, do an operation oh, I by see. Yeah. technology and in the other country so the passion is not in America but in other country but they doing it by the um by I see so technology. that's actually that's very interesting that's actually medicine so today we'll be talking about biology not about innovation in medicine uh, although there are obviously applications. Uh, I'll try one other person. Uh, let's see. Inzu Atsahanova. Inzu, what do you think? Any examples of uh, uh, innovation in biology? Hello, Professor. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> You don't know? Okay. I don't have any idea. Right. No idea. So we'll learn some examples uh, in today's lecture. So let me uh, continue here. Uh, first, we'll do some review. Uh, last week, we talked about the difference between innovation and invention. And innovation is the combination of invention and commercialization. And from a business perspective, this involves uh, taking into account three factors. Uh, what is possible with the technology? So for example, uh, Rita mentioned about remote surgery and remote surgery uh, doing an operation from uh, controlling it from far away uh, can be possible with some technology. And, and then there is the issue of uh, what is desirable to users? So do people need that technology? Uh, is it easier just to go to the hospital or is it easier to send a surgeon out there? Uh, so that depends on what the market uh, needs. And then the other aspect is what is viable in the marketplace? So you may wanna do remote surgery uh, in a rural area, but if they actually don't have the facilities or if the price is too high, uh, that's not viable in the marketplace. So you can have very cool ideas that are people want. You can have very new, fancy ideas that are possible in the marketplace. You can, of course, invent uh, very sophisticated technology, but unless these three things coincide, it doesn't become innovation because it is not sustainable and it doesn't become a wide, wider spread reality. Then we talked about more specifically the difference between creativity and invention and innovation. So invention typically involves science and art, uh, but in order to become innovation, you have various applied research and in particular marketing. So that's why innovation is very integral to business because actually it's not just the R&D lab. It's not just uh, you know, the uh, creative person in uh, one office. Uh, it involves the entire spectrum of the business uh, functions and in particular marketing is very central to innovation uh, so if you are interested in marketing you should be thinking of this as an extension of innovate in, of invention and uh, ultimately critical to implementing innovation so in a formal way definition wise invention refers to the discovery or creation of a new idea it is usually the work of an individual and in definition, by definition, invention is outside of reality. Uh, innovation refers to a combination of inventions or uh, a core invention. Innovation is typically the work of groups. As I said, you have all of these elements, uh, the, the research labs, uh, applied research, marketing, uh, finance, all of these things come together because a variety of capabilities and resources are required. And by definition, invention, uh, innovation takes this invention and puts it into reality. You also, uh, if you have taken marketing or maybe you will be taking marketing, 
an important function of marketing is of course not just advertising or promotion but also gathering information from the market so pure invention without understanding what's happening out there is rarely if ever going to become invention i mean innovation excuse me now we also talked about the important difference between product innovation which is what most people think about some sort of product and uh, process innovation uh, they are often actually linked so you may have product innovation in the beginning uh, this is the classic three stages of uh, innovation by james utterbach and then uh, over time you also develop a process around that innovation you have a dominant design emerging uh, and ultimately process innovation becomes more important so for example rita mentioned the example of remote surgery or remote operation uh, this may involve a product maybe a robot or a special operating room it may involve a tele surgery communication capability that would be the product but in reality for this to become true innovation usually some form of process innovation needs to be involved what will be the process? How do we bring the patient there? How do we bring the surgeon to the remote surgery uh, control site? Uh, how do we manage the quality? How do we uh, uh, document uh, any uh, complications? Uh, these are all process elements. Uh, and those become actually very important in innovation. And I gave the example, of course, of the, uh, excuse me. I gave the example of the MP3 player. The MP3 player was the technology uh, here. And that was the original MP3 player. It was the Korean version, the, the Rio, as I mentioned in the last week, but the mp3 player that became dominant was actually the apple iphone uh, there were some advantages of the product and most people think that steve jobs was innovative because he made a nice design and he made it simple to use which were very important indeed but in fact the true innovation was the establishment of the itunes process innovation uh, this was very interesting as some of you may well maybe you don't remember but when the mp3 players came out they were using a platform called Napster and you might have heard about that and people were downloading music and actually they were downloading the music illegally or at least they were infringing on the copyright so it became a big issue and a big uh, problem so it was technically difficult to download uh, it wasn't easy to download and the second problem was you could actually go to jail or be fined for doing that download so that was a big problem and what uh, steve jobs did in apple with this itunes was to actually create a platform where number one they could download the music easily and number two they were not downloading illegally they still paid for it but he made it so they paid a very small amount so that was actually a brilliant innovation because think about it people were getting music for free and now they're paying apple for that music uh, and so that was a you can imagine that was you know very hard uh, problem well, how, why should people pay for something that they're getting free? But he was able to uh, package that in an innovative design and an innovative process. So I, I think it's very important when you're thinking about business innovation, there's a tendency to focus on the product, but in fact, the process innovation is usually most important. I'll take a break here, not a break, not a full break, but I want to ask you 
the classic question. Uh, does anyone want to think of an example in which uh, process innovation was very important? Anyone want to volunteer for that? Uh, let's try uh, Gunawan. Um, Can you think of an example of process innovation compared to product innovation? Um, Difficult, right? Um, yeah. Maybe, um, um, Uh, okay, let's go. That's okay. I, I don't want to. Let's go to Fuang. Fuang, uh, uh, you have right. an idea. If you can't answer, don't worry. This is uh, more like a discussion. I'm not testing you, so I uh, appreciate it. I'm talking the about Fuang. the Kindle. I'm talking what? about the Kindle app to read the book online. Or maybe you, when you bought uh, the Kindle, you can read online and offline also. You need to buy many books, but they, you can like search every book in Kindle and read that uh, everywhere you want. Like if you bring the physical book, it's going to be like heavy and inconvenient. Yes. Yeah, that is my time. That, that's a great example, Fuang. So actually, I will turn this around and I will argue that the Kindle example was on some level the opposite. So if you're familiar with the history of Amazon, it was one of the first e-commerce and they were selling books. And they were selling real books, hard books, uh, print books. And uh, Jeff Bezos and the team there realized that, you know, the book was heavy like you mentioned, and uh, not always so easy. And if people could read the book online, but reading on the web or on a computer was not necessarily so easy. So he started with the product, which was the book, or actually the process, which was the e-commerce, excuse me, and went to the product, which was the Kindle. Right? So that's a little bit the opposite, but then they went back to process innovation. So now Amazon sells that Kindle. They want people to read more books. So they do things like AI to give suggestions. And they say, oh, you read this book and maybe this book, this other book will be good for you. They give, uh, they realize that selling the product, the Kindle, some people didn't want to have an extra device and as smartphones, and tablets improved. They actually put the Kindle on an app. Uh, they also uh, created, uh, uh, you know, a better process around the ordering. So it went from original e-commerce in the first generation to a product, which was the physical Kindle, and then to an improved e-commerce process innovation. So I really like that example, Fuang, because you take this chart here, which shows product innovation and process innovation, and you might say product innovation, or process innovation first, then product innovation, then process innovation. And many people make the mistake when they want to do a startup or a business, they say, oh, I have a product, I want to sell that product. And they don't look at that uh, business ecosystem and that uh, dynamics of innovation. Innovation is not one thing, usually a sequence of things. So I can think of a uh, product and process innovation that we are doing right now. You know what I'm thinking about? What? 
online class. Online class, exactly. So yes. the product would be the physical standing there and teaching. Now that we have a challenge now that is limited by the uh, epidemic. So we have to innovate and create a new process. Now you notice that I am also innovating that process based on the feedback. I, my process is evolving like a biological system. So I want to engage you more with some question before. So I'm going to add that weekly question, right? And that's the process. So that process is also being improved as we go along. You will give me some feedback. Uh, you might say, oh, this is, uh, you know, this is an idea or whatever. And I will take that feedback and innovate further. So we are experiencing that kind of process innovation, going from an original hard product, which is the, the professor speaking right there, to an improved process or different process. I saw some people raise their hand. Uh, Mao, you have an example of product and process innovation? Uh, yes. Uh, I want to talk about the shorting robot. Which type of robot? A shorting robot. S-O-R-T-I-N-G. Oh, sorting. Like, like, you know, in China now, many people buy a uh, product online. Yeah. So, should have many uh, experts. So the delivery is uh, important, uh, the problem. Yes, that's right. Yeah, uh, um, because uh, if people do the delivery, they should see the data and put the del uh, delivery to the uh, warehouse. But now uh, they have the shorting robot, they can design the line and uh, make the robots cannot uh, touch, uh, touch each other while they are working and yeah. they will put the delivery to the uh, warehouse. So it's very fast and uh, easy. That's good, that's a good example. Uh, anybody else have an example of product innovation and process innovation in particular? Professor, uh, oh, wh what about the Fitbit? Do you know Fitbit? Yes, is that uh, who is speaking now, Yata? No, I'm Soyhan, Soyhan Bay. Okay, yes. So example of Fitbit, it used to be like they used to show only the clock and how many you like have you walked and stuff. Yes. But now on uh, Apple or from Samsung, they have like Apple Watch or Galaxy Watch. Yes. Is it, is it make sense of with, with this example? Is it... Well, that's actually a very interesting example. So Fitbit uh, is it, uh, basically a step counter. And what you're describing is the replacement of the Fitbit device, which is the product, uh, with a smartphone, uh, which actually, uh, or the watch, smart watch, which actually can do the step counting instead of a dedicated instrument. Uh, that's an example of one product being replaced by another product. I don't Professor? think that's an example of process innovation. And this is Professor? a very important point because a lot of people have been talking about the step counters, uh, whether it be a dedicated Fitbit or a smartphone and and I've been studying this because one of my areas of uh, expertise is digital healthcare, but people don't use them that much. Uh, they kind of count the steps and maybe they do it for a few months or weeks, uh, but it doesn't really affect them that much. Uh, and one of the problems is nobody has really figured out in digital healthcare uh, this type of process innovation that uh, brings health data and you can actually use it very easily to improve your lifestyle. Uh, it's still a little bit, uh, how should I say, not really integrated. So for example, when iTunes came out and the iPod, 
uh, everybody was basically listening to this music and it became a very integral part of what people were doing in their lives. The step counters like the Fitbit or the smartphone still have a disconnect with influencing people's health more directly. So my point is, I think that we could use more process innovation. The world is looking for more process innovation around digital uh, healthcare. Uh, one uh, interesting issue is when it comes to digital healthcare and the processes of digital healthcare, this uh, COVID-19 epidemic may force more changes that will create new processes that people can be involved in their healthcare uh, more independently, perhaps using these uh, devices rather than always going to the hospital or the doctor. Uh, so that's, you know, we're living in a very interesting time in that regard for digital healthcare process innovation. Any other examples of process innovation, product innovation? Yes, Professor, I have an example, I think. Uh, who is this again? Shun. Uh, Shun, okay. I don't see the list here. Do you see me now? I raised my hand. Uh, you raised your hand, but... Uh... Oh yeah, Sheng Sheng Zhizhu, right? Yes, yes. Okay, right. So so, do you know Toyota? Toyota, Japanese car. Oh, good example. Very interesting. Yeah. So in the past, they produce a lot of cars a day, but they can sell them out in a day. But uh, after the 1980, they changed their production systems called GIT. It ju it means just in time. Yeah. So, they sell the car they can produce in a day, so it can improve their efficiency. Yes. So I think it's a process innovation. Okay, that's a, that's a great answer uh, because uh, I'll repeat that. Toyota was one of the first manufacturing companies to perfect the process innovation of just-in-time delivery of the supply chain. Yes. So they didn't have to have a pile of uh, uh, engines in the corner there and a pile of suspension over there and they kind of bring them together and they assemble it. They designed everything so everything comes to the assembly line at exactly the right time and that increases the efficiency of producing the cars. By the way, Toyota also perfected another process innovation called TQM. Uh, business schools love uh, these acronyms. So uh, TQM stands for Total Quality Management, and they had this feedback loop of improving quality, but that's another process innovation. But the reason, Shang Jiju, I think this is a very good answer, is that the process innovation of just-in-time delivery has now created a big problem because when the COVID-19 coronavirus hit China, uh, which of course has a lot of manufacturing, is integrated into these supply chains with just-in-time. Uh, in January, uh, Wuhan and other places in China were basically shutting down and not able to produce many of the parts that the European uh, as well as American automobile makers were making. This is just an example. And everybody was following the Toyota example of just in time. And if you're missing some of those pieces, uh, Volkswagen, uh, GM, they all had to stop their factories. So the very interesting point is that this innovation, which was fabulous for efficiency in producing uh, fast cars and then combined with total quality management quality cars and Toyota became I think the second biggest automobile maker in the world or it was very big of course uh, still is that just-in-time uh, process innovation 
has now become a big problem for the world. Uh, and this is not related to China alone. It's not, it's not about that. It's about the whole global innovation uh, based on this just in time. So it doesn't matter where you are. Uh, if there are big disruptions in this supply chain, then you cannot produce anything. So the old way of having extra supply and a little bit more inefficient uh, had the advantage of being more resilient under these supply chain stresses. So that's very interesting that this process innovation was good, but then when there are new challenges, we're going to need new innovation to address those. Uh, and that's another reason why innovation is so important, particularly when there are challenges that we're like we're experiencing now. And that's why I said, I think this type of a class is extremely important uh, for you as well as obviously society. So Shang Ji Ju, uh, that's a good answer. Uh, but as I said, one innovation for one period of time may end up not being always the best thing for a different circumstance. Uh, professor? Yeah. Um, wouldn't, if we're talking about the car industry, wouldn't a good example of process innovation be the Henry Ford's um, assembly line, the first moving assembly line? Uh, who is speaking, by the way? Katie, Katie Elizabeth. Oh, okay, right, okay. Oh, say that again about the automobile. Um, like one of the first uh, innovations, I would say, in the car industry would be the Henry Ford's, uh, the first like, movie similar line. Yes, so that was so actually, cars could be made. that's a very good example. That was actually uh, one of the very good examples of process innovation obviously in the auto industry uh, in general, but, uh, and then as Shinju mentioned, Shinju uh, further improved upon with uh, just-in-time uh, delivery. So yes, the assembly line was a major, major process innovation in the early part of the 20th century. Thanks for sharing that. So why don't we keep moving? We're going to do the review uh, and then we'll take a short break and resume with uh, the biology. So another very important concept that we talked about in innovation was the difference between disruptive and incremental innovation. So this is a, a very important chart from Clayton Christensen. This is time on the horizontal axis and performance of a product or a process or a service on the vertical axis. Uh, if we look at number one here, this is existing products or existing services are improving incrementally step by step that's why this performance is improving uh, and this uh, dotted line here is what the customer needs and over time this continuous improvement overshoots the customer needs and a disruptive innovation is one that actually has a lower performance but can at some point reach the customer needs and that lower performance, lower cost innovation will ultimately replace the existing innovation. And if one product replaces another product because of this particular dynamic of lower performance, lower cost, that becomes what we call disruptive innovation. And the reason I say this is important is uh, for two reasons. One is if you're an existing company and you see uh, this disruptive innovation coming, uh, you have to react to that. Uh, so a perfect example, as they say in the business literature, is Kodak. Kodak was a, a camera, camera company, well, actually a film company, excuse me, and they made film for cameras. Uh, all of you are fairly young, so you may not even know so much about these, but uh, everybody took pictures and they had this uh, film. Now, of course, we take pictures digitally, and that digital was less quality than a really high quality film, because the digital has to take certain pixels and has to uh, average it out. And of course, if the camera is especially the early digital cameras, they don't have very many pixels. So it was poor quality compared to a real camera. Uh, and so Kodak said, well, that's poor quality. We don't have to worry about it. 
and uh, eventually, of course, digital cameras got better and better, and they got good enough that people could take their selfies and pictures uh, and so forth. And the film industry was completely replaced. That's called a disruptive innovation. So it's very important if you're an existing company. And then the second is if you're a, a startup or you're trying to create some innovation, uh, if you try to do some incremental innovation, this is a big mistake that people do, entrepreneurs do, and improve upon something incrementally, these existing incumbents will almost always improve better than you. So if you say, I want to make a digital camera that has twice as many pixels as the Samsung camera, guess what? Samsung is going to make four times as many pixels and you will not be able to succeed. The way a new entrant comes, a new uh, company comes, is by creating a different sort of disruptive technology. And many entrepreneurs make the mistake of wanting to do an incremental improvement. So this concept is extremely important. Then we talked about the difference between open innovation and closed innovation. Uh, in closed innovation, uh, the boundary of the company is here and your research projects are confined and you get a result. In open innovation, you can exchange with other companies and you can get new ideas, new projects, and eventually you get uh, more possibility of having an innovative product. So I mentioned about, uh, uh, well, let me go back, uh, closed versus open innovation. A good example is a uh, Roman empire. The Roman empire will give uh, historical examples in lecture number three, but uh, was fundamentally an open innovation organization. So it allowed foreigners to come in and bring different ideas. Uh, and that was uh, much more effective than just devoting your own resources to the innovation. So uh, at the time of the Roman Republic, there were many Italian city-states, uh, but they didn't have that same open outlook and they didn't innovate as well, particularly around military things. So most of you are aware that the coronavirus, this is an example from biology of open innovation. The coronavirus, did not come from a previous human virus. The coronavirus came from, uh, uh, at least the, the theory is from bat virus and maybe combined with another animal and eventually jumped to humans. So that's very important because uh, when you have a virus in a totally different organism like a bat or a chicken or a pig like in swine flu uh, and combine with another animal, they can combine, get some new uh, combination that infects human beings much more effectively. So this concept of evolution and recombination of a virus among different species is a form of open innovation. You think of the closed innovation as just the evolution of the virus only in humans, but an open innovation would be the ability to combine different genetics from uh, different viruses affecting different organisms, combining to have a very innovative, unfortunately bad innovation uh, result. We talked about traditional versus reverse innovation. Traditional innovation is where you have the developed and advanced countries going to less developed countries. Reverse innovation, which is becoming increasingly important, is when you have the less developed countries going into the advanced uh, company countries. So I think Ritu uh, uh, mentioned about remote surgery. So for example, Indonesia, has many different islands and is very spread out, uh, many people, and it's very difficult to have surgical operations for everybody in this spread out area. So 
Indonesia uh, doesn't have a highly developed, very advanced medical system like Europe and, and uh, theoretically United States, although US has its problems. But the point is these are not uh, traditionally, uh, these are traditionally sort of the advanced uh, systems, but Indonesia has unique challenges unique uh, situation that they can create certain innovation that you cannot do in the advanced uh, systems. And that innovation coming out of Indonesia, for example, a remote surgery, remote operation, which becomes very important there, can then be transmitted to the more advanced countries. So that's very important to consider for the future, well, for the present and the future. And finally, we talked about organizational innovation. We have to think about how uh, companies themselves have a structure for innovation. Uh, so in other words, if we really want to innovate, we don't just come up with great ideas and implement them. We create an organization that is capable or is designed to create good ideas. So this course, for example, is in a way a form of organizational innovation because we are not necessarily going to innovate a product right now, but if we can create a mindset, we can create a uh, sort of culture around innovating, that will be a very big accomplishment. So this organizational innovation is very important. So those are some of the answers to what is innovation. Uh, it is now uh, 7.48. Uh, let's take a, a break and we will start again with uh, evolution and uh, biology uh, at 8 p.m. and we'll go for about 45 minutes. Is that okay? Take a break. It's fine. We will start at 8 p.m. Okay. Eight, okay. Okay, 8 p.m. Come back. I will uh, pause this. Another example of innovation is that of proteins. The uh, proteins themselves are very strong yet flexible. The protein is compo composed of amino acids which are connected by a peptide bond here. This peptide bond is this interaction between these two groups here and this peptide bond that combines these amino acids is both rigid and flexible. It has a unique biochemistry. I'm not going to go into the details. So that means the protein can be flexible around this bond, but also be very strong. So collagen, that protein that I showed you that was part of bone, has more tensile strength than steel. So if you look at the cables of a bridge, suspension bridge, the cables holding up that bridge, your ligaments and your tendons, which are made of collagen, are actually stronger than that steel cable for the bridge in terms of tensile strength. That is enabled by this unique chemistry. Now, you don't need to learn this chemistry for this class, but I wanna emphasize that uh, you can get this very unique properties of rigidity and flexibility of, uh, as an innovation. So as I mentioned, this is the protein. It's, it's strong like steel, but it's actually vibrating like this. It's very flexible so it can do the machinery. So when the COVID virus attacks its target cell, the proteins can move and bring the virus into the cell. Okay, so here's uh, another uh, innovation. This is a, the golden mole. The golden mole is very good at hunting for insects but the golden mole is blind. It cannot see, but it has 
extremely exquisite way of hearing. And one way it hears is it puts its head into the sand. And as you know, solids transmit sound more uh, readily and it uses its whole body as an amplifier for that sound. So its body is an amplifier for sound, so it has an extremely exquisite sensitivity and it can find the smallest bugs and uh, eat them. So here's another example of innovation in biology. So as you know, uh, your main, one of your main sources of nutrition is glucose. And you're familiar with diabetics have a high glucose, they have low insulin. And so it's very important to control the glucose level to a very tight degree. Too much glucose is not good, that's diabetic. Too little glucose and you'll faint, you know, you don't have enough energy. So how is that glucose control so well uh, controlled or so tightly controlled? So I'm going to just explain here. Uh, let me go back, sorry. So the glucose metabolism is in the liver. So the liver stores glucose. But blood from the heart, this is the blood coming from the heart, goes into the intestine. The purpose of the intestine is to absorb glucose. The intestine actually drains into the liver and that glucose is absorbed. But how is that controlled? That's controlled by insulin that's in the liver, I mean in the pancreas, secreted by the pancreas. And the pancreas will secrete the insulin in response to the glucose level, the glucose will come from the intestine and will go into what's called a portal vein to the liver. So the controlling molecule, the insulin and the glucose come together at the same time. So that's how the body achieves a very close control. Now, the reason I mentioned this is that, as you know, diabetics, they inject insulin into the, into the skin or underneath the skin. They don't inject it into this portal vein that goes straight to the liver. They inject it out into the circulation, so it has to go all around the body, and that insulin comes to the liver, but you're still eating glucose from the intestine. So in the case of a diabetic, the control circuit is not combined. That's why it's so difficult to control the glucose in diabetic patients. Whereas in a normal situation, you have them integrally combined. So you might say, well, what does this have to do with business? But if you wanna have an outcome and you wanna have a control mechanism and you're designing an organization or a business around that, you should be thinking about these sorts of mechanisms. How can we keep the control mechanism uh, aligned with what we're trying to control. This innovation answers that for the human body. So here's another example of innovation. It's the darkling beetle. This darkling beetle is an animal that lives in the desert where there is no water. Uh, I think in regions called uh, regions where they have maybe one millimeter or two millimeters of rain every year. So these are the driest environments on earth, but they have these beetles that are surviving. So how do they do that? How do they innovate to survive and actually do very well in this desert? Well, they basically drink water from the air. So there's a little bit of water vapor in the air and they have this surface here that has alternating hydrophobic hydrophilic surface. Hydrophobic means uh, resisting water. Hydrophilic means attracting water. So that concentrates the water vapor over their body. So this is hydrophobic uh, and this is hydrophilic. 
hydrophobic, hydrophilic. So it concentrates this little water vapor. So then it condenses because it's concentrated. And when it condenses, it flows down very small droplets down into its mouth. So researchers in Massachusetts Institute of Technology create a textured surface, combines alternating hydrophobic, hydrophilic materials. Potential uses include extracting moisture from the air, fog tree, mirrors, windows, et cetera. Uh, people using this bio-inspired technology to create uh, new products, uh, new innovation. So here's another example of innovation. So some of you might be asking, what is so special about glucose? Glucose is a sugar molecule that is very essential for human beings. Well, let's go back to what is, what happens when we uh, use energy from food. Uh, food is composed of all these sorts of molecules. And ultimately we combine with oxygen to give carbon dioxide. We breathe out carbon dioxide. We break down the molecules, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Well, as you know, fat has more calories, more energy than protein and carbohydrates, right? So this is a chart of the different molecules as a function of their uh, oxidation reduction state relative to carbon dioxide. That's a little bit of a technical term, but I'm going to explain it briefly. Carbon dioxide is the most oxidized state of carbon. That's why it's low energy. Methane, which is in like a methane gas, is the most reduced state of carbon. There's no oxygen there. It's a very tight uh, electrons around the uh, carbon. And as you progressively put more oxygen on this, ultimately you get carbon dioxide, you get less and less energy. So this is like fat, excuse me, and this is carbon dioxide. Fats have the most energy, carbon dioxide have no energy. We don't survive on carbon dioxide. It turns out that glucose is right in the middle of this oxidation reduction uh, sort of uh, um, oxidation reduction, what's the phrase? Uh, landscape or uh, uh, extension, whatever. So you have the most reduced, the least oxidized to the most oxidized, least reduced. Glucose is right in the middle which means you can use glucose easily to make fat. That's why high carbohydrate diet goes to fat. You can use glucose to make proteins, but you can also use glucose to break down into uh, energy. So glucose, it turns out in this category here is right in the middle. So that's an innovation that allows uh, energy to be used, but at the same time, uh, flexibility to make other molecules and to make more complex molecules. So here's another innovation. Remember I said that the human body uh, burns fat and carbohydrates to carbon dioxide the same way that a automobile engine burns fuel to carbon dioxide. But what's the difference between a human being and a jet engine or a car engine? So I'll ask you the question. Who, who wants to answer? So we're both, we're both burning carbon molecules such as oil or fat or glucose, we're burning those to carbon dioxide. What, why, what's different between a human being and a car?
we we have. Uh, can I answer? Yeah. Uh, you are asking what is different from our our organism system and from the car system? Yeah. Uh, so we have uh, we able to think and make actions by ourselves. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good answer. But I was talking more about the actual energy aspect. Sorry, this, I know it sounds like a stupid question, but mm -hmm. what's the difference between our energy? metabolism and the energy metabolism of a car I'll give you a clue what is the name the official name of a car engine does anyone know what's the name of a car engine have you heard the word internal combustion met engine internal combustion yeah no Internal combustion, combustion is, uh, means explosion. Internal combustion means a small explosion in the car engine to create a motion and that's what makes the wheels turn. A jet engine or a rocket engine is an external combustion. It creates an explosion that then moves the rocket. Are we using combustion in our bodies are we burning we're not burning right we're not exploding that's very strange right i told you we're doing the same thing we're burning a fuel to carbon dioxide but the difference between a car engine or a rocket engine and a human being is we're not exploding you don't see explosions you don't see smoke coming out of my ear right <laughs> no so how is that different? Well, that's very interesting because I show you this complex picture and it shows you that basically electrons, high energy electrons from food go into various small steps and pump out protons. These protons eventually produce ATP. You don't need to know the details. But the point is each of these little steps is like a miniature explosion. But the human body or living systems cannot be exploding. We don't burn up like an automobile engine. We're not burning with flames like a rocket. But we're doing the same thing. The difference is that instead of an explosion in a piston or explosion coming out of a rocket, which is very big, we're doing extremely miniature explosions. They're not really explosions. They're molecules and electrons, but they're kind of like explosions. So the innovation that the living system has done is to take burning and separate out the burning in such small steps that the organism doesn't burn alive. Does that make sense? That's an innovation. We can use basic thermodynamics, the same principle as an automobile engine, the same principle as a rocket, but we, the, the biological system innovates to create very small changes that we get uh, increased temperature, but we don't explode and we don't burn. I know that sounds obvious, but it's not a simple problem and it requires an innovative approach and living systems have innovated on the central problem of how do you uh, extract energy without destroying yourself. Okay, the last example of innovation is going to be about the virus. So this virus infects, the COVID-19 virus, infects the lungs. And the virus has a protein here called the spike protein. And that spike protein binds or uh, targets a protein called ACE2. ACE2 is angiotensin converting enzyme. This angiotensin converting enzyme target is on lung cells and very specialized lung cells 
This is the spike protein, this is ACE2. Uh, very specialized lung cells called type two pneumocytes. And this ACE enzyme is also involved with uh, blood pressure. So uh, this type two uh, lung cell, which is only a few lung cells in the body, about 5% are very important for lung function. This ACE2 is very important for cardiovascular function. So even though it's not many cells in the lung, this virus has picked uh, one of the most vulnerable points in the human body. So you get less of these type two pneumocytes, which are essential for function. You get this inflammation and fibrosis and the lungs looking like this. So the virus has innovated to find a very vulnerable target for uh, human beings. It's not the same as the flu. The flu kind of has a more general infection, not this very specific target. Uh, of course, the flu can be dangerous, but this virus has picked uh, a very key point in human physiology. It doesn't kill everybody, of course, but it is a very dangerous virus. And that has been its innovation, if you will. So now let's go to the second part of the lecture. How is it possible that this innovation arises? And we are gonna talk about many innovation methods in this class that you use for business, you use for your personal life, you use for your career. But the example of innovation in biology is probably the best method there is for innovation. So let's talk about what evolution is. So this is basically a short few minutes about a whole topic that is a whole course in college about evolutionary biology. Uh, sorry. So there are three components to an evolutionary system. One component is the genetics or genotype. That is the information that describes uh, how to make the organism. The second component is the phenotype or how that genetics becomes expressed in the real world. So we have DNA, but when I look at you, I don't see DNA, I see uh, your body, I see your skin, I see your eyes, all these sorts of elements are how the DNA is expressed. And we call that the phenotype. And that goes all the way from how people look, how they behave, what they do. That is the expression of the genotype. The third element of evolution is the environment. So we have three components, the genotype or the genetics, the phenotype and the environment. The environment can change. So for example, uh, Shizu mentioned about Toyota and the just-in-time supply chain. That environment was a, previously, was a good environment that just-in-time supply chain became a very powerful business innovation. Now in the coronavirus world, just-in-time innovation is actually not maybe such a good thing. The environment has changed. And whenever the environment must changes, you have to have some innovation to meet that. Our environment has changed because of the coronavirus. So we have to innovate. So those are the three things, the genetics, the genotype, and the environment. That does not describe innovation, that does not describe evol evolution, what describes evolution is the process. And these are the processes, three processes that are involved. First process is the hereditability of fitness. In other words, you need to be able to pass on the uh, uh, phenotype through your genotype. So in other words, when you have a good idea or a good uh, genetic situation for a particular environment, you need to be able to pass that on to uh, and propagate that. In other words, with children, 
uh, or with your products, whatever. The second element that's very important is phenotypic variation. Phenotypic variation is that your phenotype or your behavior or your product or your ideas are different. So we have a class here with many different students from different places. That's a lot of variation. The Roman Empire created a lot of uh, different ideas from different people, not just Romans. The open innovation, and that created this phenotypic variation. So the third element is differential fitness. You have this variation, different uh, organisms are different, different ideas are different, and they are going to match the environment differentially. Differentially means differently. So some ideas will be good for that environment. Some ideas will be bad for that environment. Just in time supply chain is good for pre-corona. Just in time supply chain may not be good for post-corona uh, pandemic situation. So in other words, there's no such thing as a best product. There's no such thing as the best genes. There's no such thing as the best culture. You know, Chinese culture, Korean culture, lots of people saying we're the best. There is no such thing as the best. It only is, how is it matching the environment? So in some environments, maybe the Korean way is better. In some other environments, maybe the Chinese way is better. Uh, but ultimately, very smart, innovative people realize that uh, many different possibilities. This phenotypic variation is the best way to approach environmental challenges. So this is why this is so important for innovation because just having one idea with no variation is unlikely to create variation. It's important to have many ideas and it's also important to uh, test those ideas in the environment. So I can have a brilliant idea on how to do online teaching, but if I'm not actually doing that teaching and I'm not interacting with students and making mistakes and uh, coming up with new ideas, if I'm not interacting with the real environment, which I'm doing now, then I won't be able to innovate. And then this transmission, if I'm like a Leonardo da Vinci, if Leonardo da Vinci is so creative, but he never wrote his notebooks and he just thought of the ideas on his own and never shared them, then it would never become innovation. So right now I am recording this video. I, will, I didn't record all of it because I'm still getting used to it. <laughs> but uh, I will put that on the LMS. I will transmit that. It will increase the possibility of feedback, spread the ideas. That's the hereditability of fitness. So different ideas, testing with the environment, transmitting and communicating that. This is what makes evolution possible. And this is also related to innovation. This is why we talk about these concepts in biology uh, as being so central to the essence of innovation. Innovation, as you already know, because we talked about it, uh, is not just a great idea. It's usually many ideas tested with the environment, shared with other people, and disseminated. And that's what the evolution is. Uh, we will continue, but this is a very important slide. Uh, any questions? You can type them in or you can, you can say them directly. Can you explore? Uh, can you explain again? There are no types. So genotype is like the DNA. Okay, we all have DNA. Uh, the COVID virus has RNA, by the way, and it's transmitting that genotype throughout. But everybody in this lecture is not just a bunch of DNA, right? You are speaking, you're thinking, you're moving, 
uh, Marius is uh, touching his head, you know, all these sorts of things. Uh, Ruti is uh, rubbing her eye, Putri is rubbing her eye. You know, this is your phenotype, your behavior. Okay, I don't see DNA when I look at you, right? I, I see the phenotype. But the phenotype is not, you know, when we die, the phenotype goes away. But we transmit our ideas or we transmit our DNA, right? So that's the genotype is kind of like the core idea. The phenotype is how that idea is expressed in reality. And the environment, of course, is that reality. Does that make sense? It's a little bit abstract because I'm not here to teach yeah. you biology. This course yeah, is about innovation. It. But I think it's very important that we understand biology. At least, I don't, I'm not teaching you to be evolutionary biologists. But we should understand the basic principles because it is at the essence of innovation. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, let's go. Uh, we're going to skip this. Let's actually skip to the third part. So I'm going to talk about some examples of bio-inspired innovation. Uh, I think one of you gave an example of bio-inspired innovation uh, at the beginning. I forget the example right now. Uh, yes. but airplanes. Ah, the airplanes. That's right. Birds and airplanes. Thank you very much. So uh, there's many examples of bio-inspired innovation. We look at biology and say, wow, that's very cool. Maybe I can use that idea to solve engineering problems. So everybody talks about neural networks and artificial intelligence. Well, neural network is based on neurons, which are the brain cells, and they have these electrical signals. This is a, a brain cell. Uh, it has two parts, the cell body and the axon, and impulses arrive they are added together and if there's a certain threshold then a big signal is created so this cell is basically kind of a integrator uh, of inputs and if the inputs are enough at some threshold you get a signal coming out and a neural network is a computational expression of this integration uh, system over many uh, neurons, and we call that a neural network. And as we know, brains are good at learning, and it turns out that these neural networks as computationally expressed are also good at learning. So uh, there are many centers for bio-inspired innovation around the world, uh, in London, in Oklahoma, at uh, Harvard, uh, this is Georgia Tech, University of Maryland, Case Western University, Austria, Pennsylvania State University. These are all bio-inspired institutes around the world. So this is an increasing area, both as an independent study and, of course, in your own innovation. You should be looking at biological examples, not just products, uh, but also processes and organizational innovation. How does the body organize everything? How does it get the inputs and the outputs? These are all central questions for business. So we have soft manipulation, like soft robotics. People have talked about ro robots, but the human body is soft and it moves and it's flexible. So those mechanical hard metal robots, uh, obviously we want to move to some kind of soft robotics. So there's innovation, this is in Singapore, of soft wearable robots, for example. Uh, Bio-inspired innovation for air purification uh, based on a butterfly structure. Uh, information storage in DNA. As I mentioned, the genotype or DNA is your information. 
that's a huge amount of information stored. Can we use DNA as a kind of memory uh, chip? So that's a bio-inspired innovation. The eye is very interesting. The retina is a uh, kind of a camera, but the camera that you have in your smartphone has pixels and those pixels will send either light or no light to the central processing unit. Uh, and the retina in the eye is composed of these light sensitive uh, cells and they send the signal to the brain, the central processing unit, but in between the sensing and the optic nerve, you have all these other cells that do some pre-processing. In other words, the ca this camera smartphone, uh, the camera or the equivalent of the retina is not very smart. It just transmits signals essentially to the uh, central processing unit. In order to have image recognition, you have to have a lot of computation, artificial intelligence, et cetera. But the human eye does not do that. The human eye actually processes some of the information in the retina. It's as if the camera itself was a computer. The camera, the, the photosensitive spot, uh, 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 photo detector, as if that was a computer. So we call that a visual preprocessor. So this is a paper I wrote or presented with colleagues at uh, Samsung. Computationally efficient real-time motion recognition based on bio-inspired visual and cognitive processing. So I'm not a uh, AI specialist. I'm not a computer scientist. Uh, I've done computers work in the past. And these are uh, colleagues who are computer scientists, but my name is there because we brought together and I mentioned about the biology, we discussed it, we designed it based on the biology. We developed a neural network system that was modeled on the retina to make it much faster for image recognition in real time. So that's an example of bio-inspired innovation. This is another example of bio-inspired innovation, a paper I wrote with another colleague, Min So Kim. So this is a paper we published uh, and I was a co-author on that. We wanted to do a filter for cells and the filter would often get stuck. And so instead we did a filter that was based on the same idea as the lungs. We call that a trachea inspired, the trachea is here bifurcated, bifurcated means goes twice. So we built a filter that had two pathways to have a much lower chance of getting clogged over just a single pathway filter. And it was based on this concept of the two lungs. And if you have a blockage in one, you don't immediately die. You can breathe with the other lung and eventually that blockage can be cleared, cleared up. So that's an example of bio-inspired innovation. A third example of bio-inspired innovation, I apologize, this is in Korean, but this is a patent that I uh, wrote with uh, three, two colleagues. And this is an example of using very briefly the biological radiation from proteins as a way of detecting living organisms on automotive self-driving radar. So I'm not an automotive expert. I'm not a radar specialist, but I collaborated with two other colleagues who were radar specialists, and we created a patent to detect living organisms based on their specific radiation properties as opposed to doing kind of artificial intelligence and seeing that it has two arms and two legs and sensing it that way. So that's another example of bio-inspired innovation. So Jeff Bezos, we mentioned that about uh, Amazon, what's dangerous is not to evolve. So this virus has evolved. Human society has not evolved to address these pandemics and all of us are suffering 
at this time. So we must evolve in order to innovate. So that was the purpose of today's lecture, was to share a little bit of examples of uh, biology innovation, to talk specifically about the process of evolution, and thirdly, to give some examples of bio-inspired innovation. So next time we are going to do uh, innovation in the ancient world. We're going to talk about some history of innovation. So that will be, today was a little bit of biology. Next week will be a little bit of history. Now, there is a method to my madness. You might say, why am I here learning biology? Next week I'm going to learn about history. Then I'm going to learn about physics. This is ridiculous. I'm here to learn about innovation. Well, I'll tell you a secret. Innovation is about combining ideas in new and different ways from a variety of fields. If you say, I'm going to innovate just by being a specialist in one thing, I can tell you this, you are probably not going to be as innovative as somebody who uh, has a wider uh, knowledge set and or at least can work with a wider set of people to do that innovation. So the method to this class of having many different sorts of thinking ways is part of the process of innovation. Make sense? Okay, yeah. so uh, let me... Uh, where is the, sorry about that. Did I close the LMS? One second. Oh, I, sorry about that. Oh, good uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Sir. Yes. Yes. The screen. Okay. So I just wanted to mention that. Uh, please do that question by Monday. Question number two. Week number two. Question is uh, give an example of innovation from biology. Obviously, don't just copy from the presentation. Come up with some other example, a short paragraph. Uh, on Monday or before, I will post week number three question. And that will be due by Thursday by the lecture uh, next week. So just do this question very simply, and then we will go to week number three question. Uh, this question is then about innovation in biology, not about uh, biology inspired. That's right. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, you can do both if you want. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit, a little secret. Uh, you don't always have to follow my instructions. In other words, if you want to answer this question or uh, give an example of innovation in biology a little bit differently, I won't necessarily penalize you. If you give a different, you answer a different question, but if you justify, you say, well, I thought it would be better to answer this question because it's related or something like that. In other words, you're thinking innovatively. I'm okay with that. Does it make sense? Yeah. So this is a not about following. I mean, it's important to follow directions, but this is an innovation class. So if you come up with something innovative, uh, I'm open to that. I won't say, oh, you failed. But on the other hand, if you, you know, don't do it or you just come up with something totally, uh, you know. Common. 
whatever that doesn't make sense, you know, that's not necessarily good either. So uh, give an example of innovation biology, but if you want to do an example, bio-inspired innovation that you thought is interesting and cool or whatever, I'm okay to uh, get that as well. Do we have to like, explain why we choose that innovation? Are we only summarize that innovation? Well, you should summarize innovation, but I think if you give some reason why you think it's innovative, I think that's that would be nice. Okay. Is it okay to browse it in the internet? Excuse me? Is it okay if you browse it in the internet? Internet? Oh yeah, you can browse, browse it in the internet, but just don't copy it straight off. Of course, you have okay. to search around, think about it. That's fine. Do you have like a maximum words for the background? Uh, no, but I told you the shorter the better. Yeah. You know, it's actually harder to do something shorter. So if you just give me 10 pages that you just threw out there, that may, you know, may not be as good. <laughs> Believe me, I used to be a student too. I knew how to write 10 page papers very quickly, just throwing everything in there. Uh, and not that it's bad, but sometimes, you know, it's harder to do. Short. Okay, we're going to close off now and uh, take care and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.